Hello, I'm Sean Tan, here to talk about my new book with Walker Books called The Singing Bones. Oh, well, I had a very convoluted history. It started off as um, an assignment from a German publisher to do some illustrations for Philip Pullman's retellings of Grim Fairy Tales, where he'd written, rewritten the stories and hadn't really modernised them, but kind of cleaned them up a little bit and, and fixed up some logical inconsistencies in the stories. And at first I wasn't really in a position to illustrate these books because I was doing some other work, but um, after reading these versions, I, I got quite excited about the project. I thought about doing something for Grimm's Fairy Tales throughout my career on and off, but it had always been a difficult proposition because there was something almost too strange I found about many of the stories, and I love the surrealism of them, but in some ways there's there's little things that happen, um, the way things are phrased, or logical inconsistencies that kind of disengage me slightly. And it was very nice to then have these texts and um, be able to, to work with them. But the problem I had was that um, as Philip had stated in his preface to um, the original edition of Grimm, Grimm's Tales for Young and Old, that these stories do not benefit from illustration. That's more or less what he said. They, uh, what he loved about the stories, and it's what I love about them too, is that they're really hard to illustrate. They work best in the mind of the reader. So uh, everybody is a creative person. Every reader is an illustrator. It's a, it's a delicate act to illustrate anything because you don't want to interfere with the imagination of someone who's already creative. You don't want to conflict uh, the image they have in their head with something that you're creating which might be beautiful and elaborate but at the same time it's that house made of cake is not the house made of cake that they were thinking of before they came to that picture. The witch is either too scary or not scary enough um, that's not quite the forest that the reader had in mind when they were thinking about venturing down a dark path. So um, Grimm's fairy tales are very much about flat two-dimensional cardboard characters sliding on and off of these sets which exist in our head and they're very elemental and archetypal things. The moment you start to articulate them too clearly, they lose their magic. You know, they're kind of like campfire stories. The, the words are very important. Um, so that immediately set up a problem, you know, when you've got a text where the author doesn't really feel that illustrations are necessary and the illustrator doesn't feel that illustrations are necessary. Um, but I realise that throughout the centuries and even the millennia, people have been illustrating the same kind of folk tales very effectively, often using um, kind of folk art approaches, um, either naive painting but especially sculpture. And I've always been a, a massive fan of Inuit carving. Um, ever since I was a child and um, a primary school teacher gave me a, a lump of soapstone and said, why don't you have a go at, she knew I had this artistic inclination, why don't you have a go at carving this very soft rock? And I loved it and it sort of did lead me to an interest in Inuit carvings. And um, Subsequently, in my professional life, I've had the opportunity to travel to Mexico a couple of times, and I was very impressed by work in the um, anthropological museums there, and you know the 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 how modern these little pre-Columbian clay figurines are, which makes sense because so much of modern art is pilfered. Um, prim So-called primitive art is nothing primitive about it at all. It's it's very advanced visually. Um, and very restrained, um, highly educated in its approach to storytelling and, and really narrative with the ability to combine, especially with a lot of Mexican folk art, horror and humour, you know, all that Day of the Dead stuff, um, which is one reason I really wanted to have a, a skull on the cover of the book because it just has that, that strange mix of skulls, almost sort of something a little bit scary and a little bit funny but intimately human. And, um, yeah, I... I, uh, with the, this original assignment, I said, you know, could I try doing some sculptures for the book, the German book? And the publisher was a little bit reluctant, and I was a bit reluctant, but I gave it a go, and I 
I love the experimental approach. And after that, and after working on that particular edition, I got carried away and I wanted to do a lot more sculptures. I kind of got hooked. So I um, ended up with 75 sculptures in the end. Um, at some point, I just stopped. <laughs> but there's 200 stories, so you know who knows, maybe there'll be a second volume one day. But um, it was just so nice to read these stories, which were very different to anything I would imagine myself. Um, and also to have that, that kind of collaboration with something so old. Um, and of course, I grew up in Western Australia, which is so far removed from the forests of Europe. I was just actually walking through some forests recently in, in Switzerland and thinking, so this is what they're talking about, but it's, it's not what I could imagine growing up where I did reading these stories. So I don't know if that affects the kind of work, the fact that I'm coming at it from such an odd distance, but I think that can only help because it, you know, I'm t taking nothing for granted, um, nothing about wolves and foxes for granted. They're kind of almost fantasy creatures for me or something from dreams. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just, um, it's been possibly the most enjoyable project that I've ever worked on, which is saying a lot because my books are pretty enjoyable, but I had so much fun with this. I almost felt a little bit guilty. Like this work can't be any good because it's, I'm just having too much fun. But um, I think, I, I hope that that infects in other readers anyway that they, you know, I do have a theory that if the creator's having fun, then the reader probably will too, and they'll get as much out of it. So hopefully that's the case. Yeah, sculpture is a very different medium. It's, um, first thing about sculpture is that it is a, not so much three-dimensional versus two-dimensional. The difference is a sculpture is the thing. A painting is a representation of a thing. I do have a tendency with my style of illustration in whatever medium to um, try and make sculptural form. And, you know, I'd only recently been working on the short animated film The Lost Thing, which is a, it's virtual, but it's sculptural, you know. It's very sculptural because you're building things in the round in a digital space. And um, it's very textural looking film in spite of the fact that it's computer generated. Um, but yeah, as a, as a child, my first love was sculpture over painting because sculptures are things in the real world. They're not, they are representations, but they're their own creature. So, and it's, it's something that's very tactile. And um, I guess with a lot of my work, I've always been interested in some sort of tactile sensation that you can communicate with otherwise simple medium and easily reproduced medium of ink on paper. Um, that's probably one reason why, aside from working on The Lost Thing, I haven't delved much into digital art because it's a little bit too clean for me. I like it to have um, accidents and grittiness and um, when I'm painting, for instance, I often, um, the painting looks too good and I have to sandpaper it or do something to it, you know, even throw paint at it. just get it more like things in the real world which aren't so controlled and it's the same with sculpture um, there's something about the the resistance of the material that's very helpful like some people would think that's a hindrance um, if you've got a vision but the thing is I don't often have a vision I, I more have an impulse and the resistance of the material combined with the impulse the two forces working against each other produces some kind of shape which then like a five-year-old doing a drawing um, you know, five-year-olds just draw first and ask questions later. That's, that's how I approach these sculptures. And that's quite different to um, how I often do painting, where because you're working within this certain dimensional space um, and composition is quite important, there's a certain amount of architectural planning that has to happen first. And normally I do lots and lots of sketches, you know. I um, usually draw the same thing five times and then move to final painting. With sculpture, um, these ones, at first I started sketching, but it wasn't helping too much. It was actually slowing me down. So I just grab whatever material I was working with and just start squeezing things into a shape. So, and there's something happens almost like um, uh, image making from the gut more than the head, because it's like, I want a fox or with, with really big ears. I just grab that and I'll squeeze those ears into existence. And it's something kind of almost, um, 
primeval biblical about doing that, um, like making these little golems. And, uh, and then you look at the shape and you, you turn it around, which is a great thing, you can turn it around so it has different shapes and come up with a different idea and, and think actually it looks more like a goat and then start bending it that way. And so the clay is a beautiful sketching medium because you're not having to erase and redraw, you just push it, pushing it this way and that way, cutting things in half, um, adding to it, squishing it up like a door face and then squish it, see what it looks like. Um, if you're doing a witch or something like that. And, uh, and then um, once the material had dried, I spent quite a bit of time cutting and carving. So I'm building it up and then cutting it back. And then with this particular material, I could build it up again, cut it back again, and in some cases, adding objects, um, often things I find in my backyard, a uh, stick or something, and just shove it in there and start working. So I was kind of like trying to, trying to keep it very, um, uh, I'm a very fussy artist and I don't like that. I, I, I want to try and be more spontaneous and do work that's a, that's a little bit more raw. And this sculpture was really a great way of doing that. And it kind of felt in tune with Grimm's fairy tales, um, trying to come up with a sense of objects that have been dug out of the ground in the same way when I read these stories, I feel like they've been dug out of the ground, like they've oozed up out of the soil like, um, you know, the way rocks rise up through frozen ground. Um, that's the way the ideas in these old fairy tales seem to have come about through constant oral retelling and then finally being written down about 200 years ago and still being rewritten and rewritten. And uh, so, yeah, um, it was a very good marriage and, uh, yeah, um, I, I wasn't sure if it would work, but it did work and so this book exists. I guess some materials were a bit unusual, um, like uh, blossoms and berries, not normally used as a sculptural medium, but because the final image was a photograph, so the sculpture was almost a means to an end. Even though I enjoyed making the sculptures, it's very much like um, theatre or film, they were set pieces. And the final image is the photograph, which did mean that you don't have the problems of duration that you might have with a sculpture where it's got to last and not fall apart. Um, many of the sculptures are very well made but some of them are extremely fragile and some of them, um, you know, where they had blossoms on them. I remember doing one which was uh, uh, this, I'll see if I can try and find it, um, which has a lot of blossoms. I have a plum tree in the backyard and it as I was doing this sculpture, the, the blossoms were coming in. And I was like, oh, that's perfect, because there's a, the character is um, Mother Holly. I think that's how you pronounce it, Mother Holly. It's kind of a frightening character. But she's actually very benevolent, and, and she lives in a strange place which you're not quite sure is it hell or heaven. And uh, I thought the blossoms, making this kind of very sort of confronting thing, and then <laughs> covering with blossoms, would be the, the, the right the right atmosphere or, or weird tension that I was after. But the, as soon as I picked the blossoms, they were just drying up, um, you know, cherry blossoms and plum blossoms. They just dry up within minutes. So I was just running back and forth, dropping blossoms on, taking photos, trying to get the right composition. Um, in other ones, um, I used, I wanted to have water, but that was very problematic, of course. So I ended up using sand which is even better it turned out because it has that strange, um, well, something very basic about drawing in sand and, and making those ripples in sand. And uh, what other materials? A lot of sticks, um, things that were lying around the studio and on the floor, old maps just stuck onto things. Uh, a hedgehog made out of nails, which is very interesting because nails get falling off. Um, where is that? I'm trying to find it for me. Hands my hedgehog. Story about a um, uh, a couple who can't have children, and then the the the, the man gets so angry. He says, oh, "You know, I'd I'd love to have a child. I don't care even if it's a hedgehog." And then turns out it is a hedgehog. <laughs> Philip Pullman.
Ellen's favourite images actually. And he said, oh, I wanted to give him a sculpture. And he said, oh, could I have that one? I said, no, it will fall apart. It's like the, the nails are just hanging on by the by skin of glue. And uh, yeah, with some of them, it was just enough to sort of um, prop them up and take a photo. Uh, and there's, the Hansel and Gretel one has actual cake decorations, so they're not going to last. Um, but yeah, that was fun to do. I mean, if I continued doing this kind of work, I'd probably end up doing all sorts of materials and um, I've seen other people make sculptures out of food and so on, which is suitable for a one-off photograph and that would be fun to do as well. Uh, well, I tend to use colour where it's needed. Um, I think my books are pretty colourful. I mean, this, this one is, yes, yeah, it's, it's very subdued. Um, you know, the images are um, often have grey backgrounds and I, you know, the sculpting material was inherently monochromatic and, and grey. Um, I think uh, colour is often very important for, you know, drawing attention to something. It's like little notes um, and it, you can't hear those notes if there's a lot of notes being played. So. Um, I always start with a black and white medium in my mind, whether I'm sculpting or drawing. Like all of my books begin in black and white. And I add colour where I feel there is some soundtrack required, you know, like some kind of, it's like adding music to a scene. There's, they still work with that colour, but it's, um, it can draw attention to some aspect. And, and red is particularly a colour that I find is very strong. Um, especially for, for stories like this because of the associations with blood and passion and fire and, uh, and hell because quite a few of the stories are set in some sort of underworld. And it's that red, there's nothing almost more striking to me than red on grey, you know, that really desaturated neutral bone coloured background. And then to have that splash of, that splash of red is quite striking in it you receive it viscerally before you even know what you're looking at. Um, and then foxes being red and um, the face of the queen, the jealous queen just being so bright red like it's on fire and stretched and distorted. Uh, so colour is, is like an e a tool of exaggeration like anything else, a way of caricaturing reality. Some stories are very hard to decide what to do because I did only want to do one singular image for each story and, and with the stinging bones it was always my intention to to reduce the stories down to a single extract so um, the, the entire stories aren't reproduced in the book it's just a single line or two which I, I felt were the, were the things that I remembered the most about each story and in the case of something like Snow White which is a very good example you know you've got dwarves you got Snow White herself um, you've got a whole kingdom, you've got forests, you've got the, there's the works. But the, the thing that stands out for me um, is the Queen because, and it's, it's one of those passages in, in the fairy tales where it, it does get surprisingly descriptive and almost revels in the description of how enraged the Queen is. Like, just, um, she's sickened by her own jealousy, you know, and she's also twisted and just psychotic. And um, the Snow White character is actually an extremely bland character and uh, frustratingly stupid. You know, she's tricked again and again. And the, the Queen is, um, is just so, such a powerful force. Without her, there is no story, nothing. And um, part of her jealousy is, is a kind of impotence, you know. Um, this other woman is more beautiful than, than she is, or at least has a perception. And she's impotent to do it. It's just, uh, can't do anything about it though. She can go around killing people. Um, but it's that I wanted to show that moment of just imprisoned by your own rage um, and almost like enjoying your own rage and, and reducing it down to simple shapes. In other um, cases, there's just some very funny incidents which are extremely memorable, uh, such as um, many of the stories I hadn't hadn't known about actually before I started this project so my reactions are quite immediate and uh, you know um, let's see I mean obviously like this, this story about the turnip the 
farmer um, <laughs> riding on top of a giant turnip as a, the way I've represented it is just such a, a, a strong image even though many things happen in that that story um, rumple stilled skin which we all know um, just the image of the this this dancing man this creature imp whatever he is taking delight um, in this weird pact that he's created with this sort of arbitrary rules but then also flying into an insane rage at the end like these characters that have no emotional control that always interests me um, this one was an interesting one um, Mother Trudy which is a I think is the most frightening story in the, in the whole book and it's one I wasn't familiar with and it's normally my approach to downplay the, the, the major elements in the story so to to understate you know especially if it's horror to be very understated and the story is about a girl looking through a window and, and seeing these different figures um, that eventually revolve, re resolve into a, a fiery demon that, that confronts her and ultimately throws her in a fire at the end it's very charming um, and I just sort of Love. Initially, I thought it'd be great to just have the sculpture of the the woman, the normal woman, just with her back turned, and you're waiting for her to turn around and reveal her true self. And then I just thought, ah, oh, to hell with it. I just draw her as the most demonic thing that I can. So it's it's the woman revealing her true self, which is not something I would normally do, but it was irresistible. And so um, there she is. She's turned the girl into a block of firewood, which has ignited, and her own head is just illuminating with glee, you know, at being able to capture this girl who's actually, the only thing she's done wrong is um, disobeyed her parents by looking into a window, so I'm not entirely sure what the moral of the story is, and many of them are so morally ambiguous too, it's, it's, it's fantastic, you know, I'm not sure if you could actually publish Grimm's Fairy Tales today if they were original stories by a contemporary author. I think it's just the fact we're so used to these horrific moments that we can we can digest them more easily. I've I've just been um, painting a lot lately. Um, I love painting things that are around me. Um, I'm very interested in going in small and local and looking at at little things. And sometimes they they emerge into stories. And and you know I've had some ideas for stories. Um, I've, I've been working with um, some giant puppet designs for a production in Melbourne that, that might be next year, and that's, that's fascinating, it's a whole different area. Um, toying around with ideas for um, film adaptations and then some discussions that are quite progressed, but that's a whole different kettle of fish, and my, my heart is squarely in um, picture book creation. I mean, it hasn't always been, but it, it's something that I feel comfortable with and um, the, the process of creating picture books is a very private one and ideas are a given time to rise or fall. That's what I love about publishing. There's, there's some opportunity to, to play around with crazy ideas and um, they're not always successful, but at least they're given room to breathe before you know, the life support is cut off. Um, and even then, a lot of the ideas that I throw away, I, I keep them all and I, they can be resurrected decades later, I've found. You know, some, some of the work, I've, including this Singing Bones, um, I remember I was thinking about this sort of book back when I was, you know, hoofing my folly around as a, you know, 21 year old in different places trying to think what am I going to do and, and thinking, you know, it'd be nice to illustrate fairy tales. I just don't know how to get into it at this point. Um, and then, you know, it's one of those projects you just have to wait until now. Um, other things, um, I don't know, I've been very interested in things to do with animals, um, which goes through a lot of my work. So I've, I've been, you know, sketching a lot of um, things to do with the human relationship with animals and how fraught that is. And, and, and quite depressing at times, the relationship that we used to have with animals, which I was reminded of partly reading these stories, how close we used to be with other animals and how we treated them as people. 
um, and how that's kind of not really part of the post-industrial culture. So, um, you know, I'll see where that goes, but um, it's just a matter of growing the garden and seeing what fruit turns up. And will there be more sculptures from you in the future? I would love there to be, but it's really a question of whether it fits the, you know, fits the story. That's always my thing is um, to never gratuitously illustrate something because I, I would like to as an artist. It has to be deeply wedded Know, genetically to the story um, style always emerges from from the concept and uh, in the past I've tried to force and shoehorn different techniques and things that I would love to paint into certain forms because I just want to do that project it just doesn't work I have to always um, strip the story back to what it's basically about and then think okay what is the best way to represent this story sometimes that's fun really fun like in this case sometimes it's 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 quite hard and uh difficult such as a book like the arrival which is a style i did not want to draw but that's what was necessary to tell that story um after trying many different things um or working on a film like the lost thing which was actually for a 15 minute film it was an arduous process but um that's what was necessary to bring that story into into reality and uh, yeah, I, I hope that there's something, that concept that comes along that works with sculpture because I'd love to do more of that.